Hello, everyone. Be sure to sub, because we're playing Ninja Gaiden. Uh, two. Two. We're playing Ninja Gaiden 2. Not the first one. We already did that one. And joining me for this to, uh, for this adventure once again is Skyzo. How are you doing? Hello, YouTube. I'm doing well. Uh oh. Is that another ominous figure I see? Yes, it is. There's certainly a lot of lightning. That's a villain if I've seen one. Nah, he's just wearing a mask to keep people safe. I always wear mine when I go out, don't you? Could be that too. Yeah. Also, did they just mention the Jakio? Uh, could you remind me what that is? That would be the main villain from last game. Oh. Remember? The anime face guy wished us a nice day. Oh, I do. He had like this really weird face. <laughs> well, it looks like he was just a goon for this guy. We're fighting a bigger bad this game. I can only imagine how much more difficult his fight will be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't imagine how much more difficult it would be. Do we actually got to fight him, though? Yeah. Yeah, we do. It's gonna be interesting. The Ninja of the Dragon Sword versus the Emperor of the Dark Sword. Ah, uh, do you see our girlfriend wielding a gun right there? I didn't see any gun. She, you just saw her pointing very dramatically? Ah, uh, she looked like she was pointing downward, though. Well, either way, that's about the most awesome thing she gets to do this game. Every other time... Doesn't have the greatest one. Brawl. Also, you saw us climbing up and down the walls, right? Yes, I did. Cool. And here we are in the beautiful city. Also, you'll notice that we have a cap on our Ninpo now, if you look to the upper left. We can only carry 40 at a time. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, it helps with balancing my Speaking of balance, they also took out the Spin Slash, so we can't just burn our way through the enemies and bosses anymore. Kind of a sad loss, but I can see why they took it out. But to make up for that, we get Ninja Friends! Uh, if you get an item with an orange ninja icon, you get a Shadow Clone, and you can have up to two Ninja Friends, so that gets super cool. And plus, we still have our invincible fire wheel, which we have right now. And unlike the last game, we can activate it any time we want to. It doesn't just come up once and then go away forever. We can pick and choose, so it kind of acts as a replacement to the spin slash. It's just that it disappears the moment it touches a boss, so you still can't just cheese them like we did last game. Yeah, I was gonna mention how when they take something out like that, they usually have something else to replace it. Yeah. In fact, pretty much all of the Ninja Gaiden games have something really obscenely powerful. One is the Spin Slash, two is the Ninja Friends and the Invincible Fire Wheel, and three... We'll get to that when we get there. Also, that boss was a little bit harder than the first game's boss, wasn't it? Well, any boss is, like, a lot easier when you have the super spin of death. Well, yeah, but, like, even in the la even in the last game, when I went without it, basically all I did was ran up to him, ducked, and then just spammed the attack button. 
That's fair enough, although... Would you say that this game is more difficult than the last one overall? Yes, actually. Why would you say that? Um, one, it doesn't have spin slash, and two... Well, there are some things about it that really mess with you, especially in Acts 4 and 5, and, uh... We'll get to that later. Right, that was really easy. But yeah, the first two acts are really easy in this game. Also, we have our new character hiding behind a wall that changes colors. I was about to mention how impressive the cutscenes are, but I guess some limitations you just can't overcome. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Well, considering... Considering how much these guys love their craft, I'm sure they're more upset about it than we are. Yeah, back in these old games, like, you had to, like, use every single resource available to you. It's impressive. Indeed. Also, that stranger, he shot the monster and not us. So already it's a big step up from the last game, isn't it? Yeah. Um, did we have anybody like that in the, in the first game? I think we did, right? The military? Um, Irene was sort of like that. Or at the very least, she shot us in the first game with like a trank or something. And then we sort of kind of got blackmailed by some CIA jerk called Foster or something. Speaking of which, whatever happened to him? Um... Well, he's already dead, as it turns out. We just don't really know that in the American version. It turns out Ninja Gaiden 3 was actually a sequel to 1 and a prequel to 2. Isn't that weird? Oh, yeah, it is. Maybe it has something to do with, like, maybe the game changed developers or something. I know that at the very least it was a different guy handling the level design. Well, usually that wouldn't be enough, but like, when you have these strange, like, things, then usually it's a different developer. Yeah. Also, yeah, do your absolute best uh, to avoid replacing the invincible fire wheel with something else. You pretty much want a death grip on that throughout the entire game, because it is so good. And all your ninja friends get it too. And now we get to probably the worst part of Ninja Gaiden 2. The stage hazards. This one blows you back, forward, or downward, depending on whatever the heck it feels like doing. Gotta be careful. I can only imagine what kind of, you know, hazards you're gonna get. We're gonna see in the later chapters here. Indeed. In fact, they persist pretty much throughout the entire game. It's only it's only till Act 7 that you finally get to an act that doesn't have them at all. Also, the wind reminds me of um, Super Mario Bros. 2, the Lost Levels, if you've ever played that game. Like, the later stages introduce the wind mechanic, and it's exactly like this, except it's like only one direction, and it really messes up your movement. You know, if it's only one direction, that's fair enough. At least then it's consistent. Yeah, here I noticed that it's, like, based on the clock, like, every end frames, you change direction. It really messes you up. Yeah. Also, since the invincible fire wheel doesn't really disappear when it hits a boss, what you want instead is the art of the fire wheel that we have right now, the one that shoots a wall of fire upward. That actually is almost as efficient for killing bosses as as the spin slash was. So the speedrun sections make heavy use of that. Like, check this out, check this out. This is how easy most bosses are. There we go. That's pretty easy, like you said. Well, that and you need your ninja friends too, because they... 
they have all the same attacks you do. The only thing they don't do is they can't duck when you do. But apart from that, yeah, it really is like having ninja friends on your side. It's super impressive that, like, what this game manages to pull off, like, with the train and whatnot, the ninja friends. Like, you pretty much don't see this in any other game. It's pretty much exclusive to certain games like this. Indeed. Also, the backgrounds. That city especially was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, like, what was that game we played, like, the night Goku? Like, this game just beats that on a whole new level. And Legacy... And Legend of the Super Saiyan was on a next-gen console. Yeah, and it looked worse than this. That's crazy. Oh, I forgot to mention the ninja scrolls. Throughout the game, there are scrolls that we can pick up that... that add 10 points to your maximum ninpo meter. And you can get up to 100 through normal means. And they can even spawn in multiple locations in the same stage, though you can't pick them up more than once. Right, so I imagine as you progress through the game, you're gonna get more and more of them, and, like, it, does it save your progress when you collect more? Uh, yes, it does. That's pretty good, then. But yeah, Skyzo can't see this, but you want to have Ryu to go over that white line at some point. And that's what causes that guy to drop down. And then when you drop down as well, he'll try to run away and go back up. So what you're doing for this fight is you wanna go to the center as he throws his first batch of spiders, climb up, jump over that white line to make him go down, go down, slash him. And you just sort of catch him in this pattern over and over again. And that's how you do it. Not so bad if you do that, but this guy seems just about impossible if you're fighting him for the first time and don't know how he works. That's just how it goes with these kinds of games. Like when it's something too difficult. Like it usually has something to do with something that like a trick that you don't know about. Exactly. Ashtar, that's the name of that, uh, scary guy wearing a mask at the start. The Emperor of Darkness. That's pretty interesting. That's a cool name. Speaking of darkness... Oh, wait, more story. <sighs> Irene got kidnapped again! Can you believe it? Well, I mean, as long as it progresses the plot. I guess, I guess. I mean, she's CIA. you think she'd be a little better about it. Anyways, though, let's talk about the stage. Now, this get stage's gimmick is that the ground gets dark. But more than that, this is where... This part of the game represents a huge, huge jump up in difficulty. Constantly respawning enemies, enemies in troublesome places, bottomless chasms, enemy spam on the screen. This is where Ninja Gaiden 2 pulls out all the old tricks of the first one, and I am just getting my butt handed to me here. Do you notice that? I do, and this is the Ninja Gaiden that I remember. Yep. You know, I guess the first two acts were just to sort of ease you into things, and now the game devs are like, okay, you know what game you're playing. You know what it's time for. Yeah. Also, I'd like to point out that if you showed me the stage, and like, out of context, just like, I would think that this would be the final stage, because it looks so thematic. And yet it's just another typical day in Ninja Gaiden. Yeah, that's how it goes for these games. Also, there's a health pickup. That's what keeps this stage from being too difficult. In fact, this game in general is more is more generous with the health pickups, but regardless, this is a good time to use our invincible fire wheel now that we've got it. Right. I also noticed that if you pause the game, the background doesn't actually, like, it continues to change regardless, so I imagine you could use that to your advantage. 
Huh. I haven't thought about that. But, thank you, Skyzo. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, pause the game until the lightning flashes again, and that'll make things easier. Also, I am taking a bit of a minor risk by jumping back to get this orb, but I still want to know if it's like an orange Nento or something. But I also don't want to get it if it turned out to be another sub-weapon like that, because, again, death grip on the invincible fire wheel. Also, that was an insane bit of platforming that we just did back then. Oh, yes, indeed. Be very careful here, more bottomless chasms. In fact, I think you're gonna wanna jump over the bats rather than try to slash them. I guess I was just relying on my reflexes too much. Well, fortunately, not every single enemy respawns in this area, so that's good. Yeah. Alright. And now for a particularly troublesome pair of enemies. Those guys just about cover all their vulnerable spots, so the only way I know of to get past them without damage is to either do this, jump, jump, slash, slash, or you lure out that running guy to the edge of the screen, run towards him, run through him as he jumps over you, and then get the machine guy, gun guy while the running guy is still on the screen. That way he doesn't respawn when you try to get the army guy. Like, I made that look easy, but it's actually a troublesome pair of enemies. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you have to play the game to really experience it for yourself. Yeah. <sighs> oh, army guy. I guess the good... Oh, here's... So this room is kind of weird. Because you see that hawk? If it hits you, and you get bounced backward, you actually run into the steps and you don't fall. And yet, you can still walk off those steps, even if you're, if they seem like they should stop you. So it, it's the collision detection's a bit weird in that sense. Also, the orb we picked up, that's one of the possible locations for a ninja scroll. But fortunately, there is another ninja scroll over the bottomless chasm that we can pick up instead. I recommend going for that because that's easier. There we go, got it. Right, and on the semi-solid edges, like I can imagine that that's either like a very fortunate bug or it's an incredible bit of foresight on part of the developers. Pretty sure it's foresight. Um, now, there's something in Act 7 that might actually be a bug, but in this case, I'm pretty sure it's foresight. Right. Now, for most of the bosses from Act 3 onward, the, s the sword only boss fights will be in the regular walkthrough videos. Um, and the fire wheel kills are gonna be in the speedrun sections, because those are the parts of the game where... where you actually... You're gonna be burning through... You're gonna be using most of your chi on invincible fire wheel if you're playing this casually. Let's put it that way. That was a really cool strategy to, like, line up your ninja buddies to slash the, the boss. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yep. Just make sure that if you can't slash as quickly as I do, that you tap left occasionally, because that boss does still inch forward bit by bit, just very slowly. By the way, could you imagine, like, trying to memorize this level on, like, a speedrun, and not use, like, uh, total assisted things? No, no I cannot. I think they like use audio cues or something like that, or they time things according to the flashes of lightning. Not sure what they do. 
Well, I guess it depends because if the the lightning is on a global timer, then they would just like if they're fast enough, then they won't have any issues. But if it's not on a global timer, then I don't know what they do. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, it is on a timer. Fortunately for them. The global one, but right. Yes, global. Okay, so it shouldn't be too difficult because you can just memorize it if they're yeah. fast enough. Yeah. Also, here's a damage boost. That's harder in this game than in the last one because... Because Ryu, when he gets bounced back, it's more to the side than upward. It's not a U-shape like the last game. Also, here is a rather confusing cutscene. Tell me what you think is going on as we go through it. Okie doke. Sure. Uh-oh. It looks like Ashtar was pretending to be Irene all this time, right? Uh, yeah, that's what it looked like. Yep. And Irene is probably still somewhere else, I would imagine. So this seems like a nightmare sequence to me. Because, like, usually when the hero is, like, incapacitated, like, it's not actually a thing. Also that. But then... Oh! There's Irene again! Or some womanly looking stranger. What's going on here, Skyzo? Well, like I said, it's probably like a nightmare sequence or something like that. Well, let's go through this bit by bit. And I had to study this cutscene a few times to get what was going on, but... There is an answer, it just wasn't directed well. Alright, so let's go through slow-mo. Now, as that line comes, you'll notice her mouth isn't moving, right? Yeah. And when this next line comes, her mouth starts moving. She's the one that says, what the, and not Ryu. And then, Ashtar appears, in front of her. Like that. He's in front of her. And then he fires his shot. I did not get that the first time. Yeah, so this is actually happening, right? Yes, it is actually happening. And Irene is actually physically present. Well, but then how, like, how is he gonna escape from this? We'll see. Irene cries out, and then... Ah! Quit it. Oh, hey! Robert again! So who is this guy supposed to be? Is he like a mentor to us? I don't know who this guy is. He just kind of randomly shows up. I mean, he's a cool character, but, like, I kept expecting him to be, like, Irene's long-lost brother or some CIA plant that was meant to betray us or something. Uh, someone who also wants the Sword of Darkness. Something, but... Or maybe her father, but no, he's just some guy that shows up to help us on occasion. Wait, so why did the bad guy leave? Is it because he got shot? Well, he mentions that in the dialogue. Robert has the place surrounded, so presumably there's also other guys. Isn't he like the, the Emperor of Darkness, though? Yeah, well... And that gunshot apparently just bounces right off him, so... I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, me neither, like, it doesn't make much sense, but... But, he does... He does give us a nice bit of backstory as to the origins of our sword, though. Uh, did he mention the dragon sword yet? Um, I, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. Okay, I think he did. So, the Dark Sword of Chaos is the main villain's main weapon. And our dragon sword is our main weapon. 
So it's kind of like a sort of light versus sort of darkness type deal, which I think is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty impressive that the game, like, when you notice, like, things like the background and how they're animated, like, it's impressive. Yeah. Although I'm not sure how Robert knows about that, but... I don't know, he's from the US military. Maybe Foster told him something. I don't know. Anyways, this is the end of today's episode. Have a nice day, and God bless you, everyone. Okay, I'll see you later, YouTube. Bye!